welcome to the 700 Club. Is the nation of Israel facing an end of an era? Enemies of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu are joining forces to form a new coalition government. And guess who's a part of it? An Arab Islamic party that's a sister to Hamas, which of course is dedicated to the destruction of Israel. And what's worse, for the first time in history, Israel will be dependent on an Arab party to hold up the majority. What a situation for our dearest ally. Chris Mitchell has more from Jerusalem. Yair Lapid is trying to form a coalition with parties from the left, right and center, along with the first, an Arab Islamist party. This is the so-called change bloc. The common denominator of the entire bloc is a desire to remove Netanyahu from office. Uh, despite the fact that Netanyahu has been a very successful prime minister by many accounts, including building up Israel's economy, its infrastructure, and its military, Netanyahu has been a difficult minister to work with. The proposed government took a big step forward Sunday when religious conservative Naftali Bennett said he would join this coalition. He would become prime minister first in a rotation agreement with Lapid. Before the last election, Bennett pledged twice he would not serve under Lapid, a key member of the secular left. The question is, can such a diverse government survive and one dependent on an Islamist party? And in fact, the Ram Party is a member of the southern branch of the Islamic movement, which essentially makes it a sister party of Hamas. And you would be depending for the first time in Israeli history on an Arab party to hold up the majority. The political uncertainty comes at a time of massive pressure on Israel after its recent war with Hamas in Gaza by international organizations, worldwide demonstrations, and the media. I cannot tell you what will happen. But one thing we know, that uh, our enemies are, are looking at what's happening here. You know, Hezbollah in the north, Hamas in the south, and mainly the Iranians are looking at what's happening inside. And if they will identify that we are weak, uh, we will pay a price for that. Lapid has until Wednesday night to present his government to Israeli President Reuven Rivlin. If he doesn't meet that deadline, the Knesset will have three weeks to form a new government. If that fails, Israel will go to new elections for the fifth time in more than just two years. Well, Chris joins us now from Jerusalem. And Chris, uh, let me ask you, how is this going to affect the Abraham Accords that were just signed by Israel? Is this going to uh, tear everything up? Well, it won't tear everything up, uh, Pat. And it's a great question about the Abraham Accords because that was really the landmark uh, Middle East uh, decision by the Trump administration as well as Benjamin Netanyahu. I will say because of probably the U.S. reluctance to really push the Abraham Accords uh, uh, forward that they won't really get the momentum they had under the Trump administration. And it would remain to be seen what kind of uh, push there would be behind this possible government led by Naftali Bennett and Yair Lapid if they would really push forward with these, uh, these Abraham Accords against some of the pressure from other people. Well, Chris, uh, let me ask you, I mean, Israel looks like it's just mortally wounded with this thing. If they have a Hamas-linked party to hold their coalition together, how can they govern? Well, it's a great question, uh, Pat. You know, it says uh, in the Bible, how can two be agreed? How can they walk together unless they be agreed? Uh, right now, it is the 11th hour for Netanyahu, there, but there's still time uh, whether or not this government is actually going to uh, come to pass. Uh, right now, there's uh, the only thing that the ide ideological glue holding all these parties together is that they hate Netanyahu. And uh, what you could imagine, Pat, the kind of government that's being formed right now is uh, if you you took Lindsey Graham, Chuck Schumer, and AOC and put them together, that's kind of the ideological differences between all these particular parties right now. That's, that's a horror story beyond imagination. But let me ask you, you had a private meeting with uh, Benny Gantz, and what did he tell you about uh, Iran's nuclear program? Well, you remember Benny Gantz. He was up with you in the 2006 uh, Lebanon War. You've interviewed him uh, several times. Uh, he said that uh, Iran is actually close to weapons-grade uranium right now. Uh, not just one bomb, but many bombs. And he says they need to know exactly when Iran would push and make a rush for the bomb. And he says it's not just a regional or uh, 
but it's a global problem and not just an Israeli problem. He says there's many flaws in the current nuclear deal. And Pat, he also mentioned the threat of Hezbollah. He says it's 10 times the danger of Hamas. You can imagine 4,000 rockets in 11 days by Hamas. You can imagine 4,000 rockets in a day with Hezbollah. They have more than 100,000 rockets, many of them precision guided. Uh, but he also said they have magnificent intelligence. And that's the quote he had on Hezbollah. And what it won't be, uh, Pat, and we were up there on the border of Matula and uh, Kiryat Shimona. He says it's not going to be a war like 2006. It's going to be much more aggressive uh, against Hezbollah. They, they warned Lebanon not to let uh, Hezbollah attack Israel. Uh, but it also leads to the point that was in that report, Pat, about uh, Israel's enemies. They're watching right now. They'll test any new government. If this new government gets, uh, gets uh, put in, they'll test it and it won wonder if they will stand up to the threats of Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, and also to stand up to the pressure coming from America and Europe. And so oh. certainly a time to be praying for Israel and the peace of Jerusalem. Last question, preemptive uh, strike against the Iranian nuclear weapons or not? Well, I would think so, Pat, if Iran Israel says that uh, what it has been saying for years, and, and, and in fact, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu just a few hours ago said that even at the uh, cost of the friendship with the United States, they will not uh, let Iran get a nuclear weapon. And uh, they see what's going on in Vienna as the U.S. indirectly negotiates with, uh, with uh, Iran, and they see the pressure right now. In, in fact, the head of the IAEA says that uh, Iran is now enriching uranium 16 times more than what's required in the Iranian nuclear deal. So I think Israel is watching both these things happening, and they will do what they can. They will do what they have to to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Chris, thanks for joining us. Stay with it, brother. You're doing some great job on reporting. Well, in other news, crippling deficits. That's what President Biden's proposed budget will inflict on us, our children, and our grandchildren. So how much will servicing that debt cost by 2031? John Jessup has the staggering sum. Thanks, Pat. President Biden's $6 trillion budget proposal promises to spark intense debate, particularly over deficits. His budget combines three major agendas, the $2.3 trillion on the American Jobs Plan, the $1.8 trillion American Families Plan and the $1.5 trillion in discretionary spending. The nation's already expecting a $3.6 trillion deficit for fiscal 2021. This would add deficits ranging from $1.3 trillion to $1.6 trillion for years to come. By 2031, the cost of servicing that debt would reach $914 billion. That's more than 11% of total spending. Well, China announced Monday it will allow... Uh, sorry, Pat, back to you. I, I, I'll, I'll take it later. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, Pat. As I was saying, China announced Monday that it will allow married couples to have up to three children after the latest census showing only 12 million babies born in the last year. The fourth year in a row, the birth rate dropped. Population numbers also show an increase in the number of Chinese over 60 years old, up to 18.7% of the population. For more than three decades, China enforced a one-child policy to control population growth. In 2015, it allowed all couples to have up to two children. However, the birth rate kept dropping. Pat observers say this latest move reflects deep concerns among China's leadership. Isn't it amazing? We are talking about a population explosion, but we need babies, and those babies have the potential to be great men and great women. And I remember a few years ago that the Han Chinese were concerned about the purity of the Chinese race, and they weren't permitting uh, marriage with other people of other religions. So I don't know what this is going to do, but it's an amazing turnabout in China, which shows they've got a demographic crisis just like Japan has been having for so many years as the population gets older and older and fewer and fewer people are paying for the social security to take care of the elderly. You know, it started out here in America where there's 70 people for every elderly and then there were 20 and then there were 30 and now we've got about two or three for every older person and before long we're not having enough people to support our growing elderly population. We need birth to happen 
Birth rates are very, very important for any society. John? You had a smoother handoff there. Calls for investigating a lab in Wuhan, China, as the source of the COVID pandemic are growing. This, as intelligence services in the United Kingdom are now saying that the theory is feasible. British spies once dismissed the notion. Now a Sunday report from the Times of London quotes a British intelligence source as saying, quote, there might be pockets of evidence in either direction, but we might never know the truth. Last week, President Biden ordered a U.S. intelligence agencies to investigate the matter and report back within 90 days. Well, this past weekend, Americans enjoyed many freedoms they hadn't experienced in more than a year. Memorial Day barbecues and parades were turning in full swing. And with more than 50 percent of adults now fully vaccinated, many Americans hit the roads and took to the skies. CBN's Jenna Browder has the story. Memorial Day was the first maskless holiday in more than a year for many Americans. And across the country, people were out and about honoring the fallen and marking the unofficial start to summer. I'm feeling free. <laughs> no mess. A sentiment shared by many. Over the weekend, an estimated 34 million people hit the roads. And at airports, more than 7 million screened between Thursday and Sunday, shattering expectations. This is why this airport is open. This is why these new flights are happening, because people are traveling. They're able to travel, and it's because of the vaccine. Crowds gathering on beaches, backyard barbecues, and parades honoring the fallen. We can finally shake hands, talk to each other, enter places without masks. This is the way it should be. At Arlington National Cemetery, a solemn speech from President Biden, who remembered his own son. I promise you this. The day will come when the image of your loved one will bring a smile to your lips before it brings a tear to your eyes. With more than half of all American adults now vaccinated, a return to crowds and big events. The fans are back in the stands. The Indy 500 packing 135,000 fans in the stands, the biggest event since the pandemic. The country now reporting fewer than 20,000 new cases per day, the lowest number in more than a year. You feel the unity of everybody finally being able to come outside without having to worry, you know, as much about getting sick. And experts are tracking a new variant out of Vietnam that has similar features to the more contagious UK and Indian variants. They say, though, the vaccines should protect against it. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Even as we memorialize those who served, Pat, it is nice to see us return back to normal. It certainly is. And we was just a hallelujah. That crowd at Indianapolis was one of the biggest in, in a year. Over 100,000 in Charlotte, it was over 50,000 at a NASCAR race. So uh, it's, it's tremendous. And we're very happy. You know, the truth is, outside has never been the danger that we have portrayed it to be. And the idea of forcing little children to get vaccinated when they don't want to be, I think, is, is not wise because little kids really haven't suffered too much from it. And what we have said all along, and I think the truth is that the people who should have been isolated are those who are the most prone to some kind of illness and the vulnerable should have been taken care of and the rest of the population should have been opened up. We have shut the economy down far too long, and the cost has been simply staggering. But praise the Lord that we are opening back up, and and I I hope it won't just be an open up to pure hedonism. It's nice to see churches now full, and uh, people coming back to worship God as well as the other things. Today is the official start of hurricane season. Do you remember how active last year's hurricane season was? so active, meteorologists ran out of names for them. 30 named storms hit the U.S., including 14 hurricanes. So we got a year coming up. What does it look like? Heather Sells brings us this. 2020 brought more than a pandemic. It brought a record-setting hurricane season with 30 named storms and 14 hurricanes. Look at the windows blown out of that building. It started in mid-May and ended in late November. We've got tree damage to virtually every tree. We have building damage to virtually every building. Forecasters predict another active season this year, but perhaps not quite as tough. 
Weather Bell and NOAA both predict up to 20 named storms and anywhere from half a dozen to a dozen hurricanes. Three to five could be major. The Gulf and mid-Atlantic states may fare the worst, with risks predicted six times the normal impact, less severe further up the east coast. Warmer waters, La Nina conditions, and other factors will likely all play a role in shaping what's to come. And meteorologists warn that storms can stay offshore and still blast communities with hurricane-like conditions despite not having made landfall. For now, those at risk can take advantage by prepping supplies and checking evacuation routes. Heather Sells, CBN News. Well, thanks, Heather. Joe Bastardi is chief meteorologist for Weather Bell Analytics. He's also the author of The Weaponization of Weather in the, quote, phony climate war. And Joe joins us now. What can we expect in the months ahead? Well, first of all, like I love to do is put things in perspective. Last year, uh, you know, my company not only uh, tells you how many they're going to be, or we try to tell you, only God knows tomorrow, but we also showed where they were going to go. And, uh, you know, uh, I, that was almost divinely, it had to be divinely inspired last year because of the fact that uh, when it was all said and done, it looked like our forecast was uh, basically uh, uh, showed exactly where they were going to go. We had the Northwest Gulf loaded up. We had the uh, situation up the eastern seaboard. And this year we expect similar high in, a high impact year, not as bad as last year. Now, let me put this in perspective, okay? While we had 30 storms last year, did you know for a major hurricane season, the storms were the weakest per storm on record? We have something called the ACE index. I'll give you an example. The 1950s, the average storm would pile up an ACE index between 10 and 14. Last year, there were only six because you have a lot of storms out in the middle of nowhere that are getting named nowadays because we can see them and because the naming criteria is a little bit different. Secondly, in the Pacific Ocean, we had the second lowest total on record out there as far as the ACE index goes. And the Pacific is a much bigger indicator of climate than the Atlantic. It's four times the size of the Atlantic, and you get a lot more action out there. This year, what we're expecting is a similar year to last year, more storms out at sea. But the problem we have on the United States coastline, again, is due to the overall weather pattern, the development of storms in close to the coast. You know, it's Laura, Harvey, Michael, the big hitters, they all develop within a couple of days of the coast. The long track storms tend to weaken as they come to the coast. And what we are also concerned about is that one of these African waves, instead of staying out or instead of even coming in and moving due north up the coast like the classic storms do, may take what we call the shortcut. What's the shortcut? 1933, Virginia Beach hurricane came in from the southeast rather than hit from the south. Hugo hit Charleston from the southeast. Isabel hit Cape Hatteras. Uh, that area from the southeast. 1903, the Vagabond hurricane in Atlantic City hit from the southeast. These are storms that come in off the water rather than sweeping up the coast, and they have a quite different impact. If you get hit in Virginia Beach, uh, the, uh, the tidewater area, from a storm coming from the southeast, what happens is it pushes water back into Chesapeake Bay so much so that leads to more extensive flooding. The New Orleans situation here would be a category two or three, with Katrina, would be a category two or three hurricane that makes landfall on the North Carolina-Virginia border and shoves the tidal surge back into Virginia Beach. Same thing in Philadelphia and Wilmington. Same thing for Atlantic City. You saw what Sandy did in New York City when it hit from the east in southern New Jersey. So uh, we, we've got that concern this year that we see one of those storms that comes in from the southeast, and that's something we've got outlined in our forecast, too. Joe, let, let me ask you one question. I understand that the long-range weather, I mean, many, many years, that there's a shift from the warming to the cooling. Do, do you have any stats that indicate that, that we might be coming into a little ice age sooner or later? No, I don't believe that for a second. I think, I listen, I think a lot of the guys on my side of the global warming issue, and I'm not trying to get anybody mad, I think they want to see it cool so bad they don't understand that the, the reason 
Listen, it's the total picture. It's always the total picture. People tell me, oh, it's CO2. CO2, uh, dis <clears throat> excuse me, uh, suffers destructive interference from all these other things that go on, just like the solar cycles, th uh, there's destructive interference to that. What are you going to do with the warm oceans? We even have something in the oceans. Uh, I'm sure uh, you mariners out there know what a rogue wave is. All of a sudden, you, you're out in the middle of nowhere. This big wave comes along because it's an intersection of many things that develop far away uh, that come together. Well, the same kind of things can happen in climate cycles. So what happens is people are all, people. It's interesting today, Pastor, in that people want one answer for one thing right now rather than looking at the entire picture. I tell people all the time, you want to look scripturally at this, the, the words that are spoken in the Old Testament, it's still God, but he speaks a different way than what he does in the New Testament. But you got to look at the total picture of things, right? It's the okay. same message, but the total picture. So it's not just one thing, it's a combination of everything. We got you, Joe. Thank you so much for being with us. Joe Bastardi. Interesting. It is interesting. And as usual, we all need to be prepared for whatever. Yeah, well, I, I was uh, there in New Orleans after Katrina, and boy, the devastation. When that water begins to break through the levees, and he's talking about a blow coming that would push water, for example, in our area up into the yes. tide water, then we'd have serious flooding. Well, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Pray. A head slam into cement. Whew. That's what happened to Mickey Holiday when he chipped and fell on the sidewalk. Mickey hadn't taken any medicine in years, not even an aspirin, and he wasn't about to start now. So when the headaches and dizziness became unbearable, what did Mickey do? You're about to find out. Felt like a freight train I hit. So I got back up and walked over there, and I saw there was like an inch difference, a crack in the cement, but it was violent. 80-year-old gospel musician and songwriter Mickey Holiday had been on his daily walk in September 2020 when he tripped and hit his head hard on the sidewalk. The lump on his head was sizable and bleeding. Someone came up and said, hey, can I get you some ice water? I said, oh, no, 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 I'm okay. But I, I was really hurt. Mickey made his way back to his apartment to lie down, and the headaches started. He went to his computer and looked up concussion, where he saw a number of worrisome symptoms. There was all kinds of possibilities of what could have happened. Your brain bleeding. And others, like dizziness and memory loss. Although concerned, he wasn't interested in seeing a doctor or taking pain medications. I haven't had aspirin in many years. I just decided not to take all that stuff. Then after a week of intense headaches, he started having bouts of dizziness. There was at one point I crawled on all fours to get around my room. The fear grew in me, you know, what, what could have happened? Mickey immediately began praying for healing as the pain and dizziness kept him from enjoying life, especially playing music. As fear and discouragement tried to command his thoughts in the coming weeks, he fought back with words of faith from Scripture. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I will not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. At one point, he asked his pastor to anoint him with oil and pray. James 5, 14 says, Call for the elders of the church, have them anoint you with oil, and pray for you, that you be healed. That's not a new verse. It's been there forever. Then on November 6th, two months after he fell, Mickey was watching the 700 Club Interactive Show when the hosts, Gordon Robertson and Terry Mewson, started praying for viewers. He heard Terry say, There's someone you've been, uh, you've fallen, you've tripped, you've stumbled um, over a, some kind of uneven ground, but the damage from that's been unbelievable. And you're so discouraged. God is healing every single thing you're facing right now in Jesus' name. Be restored and made whole. That's me. She's talking about me. The headaches, the dizziness, all of it went away immediately. And soon Mickey was back to his daily walks and making music for the Lord. I feel great. People respond to me about this. They say, oh, I'm glad you're feeling better. I am too, but that's not the point. The point is 
God spoke to a woman on a TV show and spoke directly to my situation. That's the point. That's the miracle. I love it. God spoke to a woman on a TV show. That woman is sitting beside me right now. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvelous? How God just gives us the assurance yeah. that He's healing, that He's moving, that He sees us, hears Boy, us, knows our pain. He is so happy. Amen. Well, here's one. Barbara, who lives in Cape Coral, Florida, was experiencing a fluttering heart. Her doctor wanted to give her beta blockers. She had low blood pressure. While watching our program on May 18th of this year, Barbara heard Terry say, someone else with a heart condition, your heart flutters, it's unnerving, God is healing you, breathe evenly. And by faith, she started breathing and she is feeling much better. What Wonderful. else do you have? Well, this is Angel. He and his wife are CBN partners from Carrollton, Texas. About eight months ago, his wife started having excruciating pain in her right foot due to bone spurs. While watching this program, she heard you, Pat, say, somebody with the bone spur, there's a bone spur in your right heel. It's been so painful. Every time you step down, it hurts so much. You just got healed. Bone spur dissolved. The pain left immediately. With joy, she began pushing on her foot to see if this could really be happening. She said, hallelujah, the pain is finally gone. Yeah. Hallelujah, indeed. That, praise God for that. Now, listen, folks, God is no respecter of persons, and He loves you, and He wants to bless you. And the Bible says, for beloved, we pray that you may be in health even as your soul will prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. We're going to pray for you, and the Lord wants to heal you. So Terry and I are going to join hands, and we're going to believe God. Father, we praise you. We thank you. Thank you for what you have been doing. Thank you for the touch of God in people's lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So somebody, oh my goodness, there's an intestinal parasite that has fastened itself on for you. You've been having some kind of uh, frequent diarrhea, and you've been having stomach aches, and you didn't know what it is. Get the right medicine for it. But right now, God is, is taking away those parasites, and you're being healed. You'll feel heat in the middle of your stomach. In Jesus' name, Terry. Yes, someone else, you've aspirated something that's very damaging to your lungs, and it's really created some chaos for you. God is healing all of that. Everything that was damaged will be made as new, and you'll be able to breathe freely again in Jesus' name. Uh, there's a man named Nicholson, I believe. Your right thumb is sore. Uh, it's... I don't know, did you break it or it's been wrenched in some fashion? It just got healed. Terry? Yes, yeah, someone else, you have a problem with um, like your muscles seizing on you. You can't bend over and touch your toes anymore. You're not an elderly person. God is touching your body and healing your whole system from whatever it is that you're suffering from. Mobility, just right now, stand up and begin to twist and turn, bend down. It's all restored in Jesus' name. Uh, there's a woman, I believe your name is Mary Sue, and you have congestion in your lungs. And uh, I want you just, Mary Sue, just cough. <laughs> and then breathe in deeply, and you are totally healed. Mm -hmm. Now, Father, for all those in this audience praying, Lord, we thank you that we've just had Memorial Day to honor the fallen on the many wars we have fought. And Lord, what we do is ask for peace. Lord, we pray for Israel, the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for our friends here in this country. Lord, and we pray the division. A house divided can't stand. Lord, Israel is divided. It can't stand. America is deeply divided, and our nation will be torn apart. Somehow, somehow, give us a point where we can please you and bring about harmony in our midst. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Mm -hmm.
Welcome back to Washington for the CBN Newsbreak. President Biden is taking part in a remembrance of one of the nation's darkest and largely underreported moments of racial violence today, the destruction of a thriving black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma back in 1921. It started with unproven charges that a black man assaulted a white woman in an, ele in an elevator. A candlelight vigil was held in Tulsa Monday night, marking 100 years since the destruction of an area called Black Wall Street. Up to 300 black residents were killed and thousands of survivors were temporarily forced into camps. Oklahoma public schools were not instructed to teach students about the massacre until 2002. While a glimmer of hope and reconciliation arising out of the ashes of the Middle East recently scarred by violence, the death of a Jewish man killed by anti-Israel rioters opened the door for new life for an Arab woman who received his kidney and a long-awaited transplant. She'd been on the organ donor list for 10 years until matching with a registered Israeli organ donor who was a perfect match. While the two never had a chance to meet, she hopes to visit his family after recovering. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. On fire for his faith. As a teenager, Michael Wilder was a superstar in the LDS Latter-day Saints Church. He worked tirelessly in the Mormon temple leading up to his two-year mission trip. Then, just months into his mission, Michael was confronted with a challenge. What was it? Take a look. Author Michael Wilder was raised in a devout Mormon family. As a passionate follower of his faith, he worked tirelessly to earn his salvation through good works. After high school, Micah embarked on a two-year mission for the Mormon Church. Four months into his trip, he approached a Baptist minister with the intent of converting him to Mormonism. The pastor met his efforts with a surprising challenge. In his book, Passport to Heaven, Micah shares his spiritual journey of leaving a religion based on human works to embracing the life-changing love of God. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Micah Wilder. Micah, it's nice to have you with us. You grew up in a devout Mormon family. Tell us what your faith meant to you during that time. When I was growing up, my faith was everything. My, my, my religion defined me. It was my identity and every facet and aspect of my life was rooted in my relationship with God that I was seeking to establish through my faithfulness to Mormonism. We've all seen the fresh-faced young men on their bicycles and their shirts and ties knocking on doors in our neighborhoods. How important was that two-year mission trip to you? It was very important to me. In fact, it was kind of like a cultural rite of passage for me. And I, I was very excited about this opportunity to go out and to serve my religion, to serve my church, and to serve God for two years and do what I believed God was calling me to do. So you wind up going into this Baptist pastor's church and you went in with the intention of challenging him and converting him. In the end, he challenged you to something. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I engaged with this Baptist pastor with the intent that I was going to bring him into my religion. And I believed, as I had been taught, that the Mormon church was the exclusive way to eternal life. And uh, as a result of this experience and this encounter with this Baptist minister, he very lovingly and gently shared the gospel with me. And at the end of this experience, he challenged me to read the New Testament through the eyes of a child. And that challenge ultimately set my life uh, on a trajectory that would change everything that I had ever known and loved. Yeah. Your life radically changed over a two year period. And uh, I mean, it was, it was challenging to me as a Christian to read how the scriptures had so jumped into your heart and, and began to define the way you thought. In the end, you came to Christ, you realized that in your f Mormon faith, you had been trying to, uh, to do service for God, to win your way to heaven, to become uh, really seen in the church as valued. In the end, you became a believer in Jesus Christ, recognizing that he was the only thing you needed for salvation. You were actually threatened with excommunication. Ultimately, you left the church. Tell us about that. So as I was on this two-year mission, I was going throughout this process of reading the New Testament daily. I actually read the New Testament in its entirety 12 times 
while I was a missionary for the Mormon church. And it was through the water of the word of God that washed me and cleansed me and opened my eyes to, to the sufficiency of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And I realized that I could no longer, you know, endeavor to earn or establish my righteousness with God through my faithfulness to Mormonism, but I could only trust in the finished and completed and perfect work of Jesus that was accomplished on the cross. And so I became born again as a Mormon missionary and uh, ended up being put in a situation where I was challenged by my Mormon leaders about my faith in Jesus and ultimately led to me uh, terminating my mission three weeks early and having to go back to Utah and face the cultural and relational repercussions of my newfound faith. I'm not sure people realize what kind of uh, letting go that involves. This must have been hard on your family. You had a fiance, uh, your, fam your whole family was very involved in the Mormon church. What did you, what, tell me what you felt when you realized making this commitment to Jesus Christ meant walking away from everything that defined who you were. Yeah, I mean, at that time of my, my life, my mother was actually a tenured professor at BYU, the Mormon University. My father was a high priest in the Mormon church and, and every relationship and, and every aspect of my life was because of my faithfulness to Mormonism. And I remember going through this experience where I was facing this crossroads and that crossroads was either to do as Christ commanded and to take up my cross and deny myself and lose my life so that I could find it or I would, you know, find my life and lose it. And so I was challenged by the gospel, by Jesus, you know, calling me into discipleship. But I also realized in that moment that it didn't matter what I lost or what I gave up or, or what I would have to sacrifice for the gospel because the gain that I had in Christ was infinitely and eternally greater than anything that I would ever lose. And like Paul said, everything I counted as gain in my life, I consider them as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. You have a great heart for the LDS people as Christians. What's the best way for us to reach them? We have to reach them with love. And, and I had a lot of encounters as a, as a Mormon missionary in the state of Florida where Christians did not reach out to me in love, but they were unkind, they were self-righteous, they were judgmental, they would slam doors in our face. And my encouragement to the Christian body is that we have to speak the truth in love and we have to be bold witnesses of the gospel, but we have to do it with gentleness and respect as we are commanded to do in scripture. Yeah, we have to know what we believe and be able to share it to do that. Micah, your book is a challenge to Christians and I'm sure uh, a, a truth offer to all who are looking for what the Bible really has to say. You've written a fascinating book about your journey to faith in Jesus Christ. It's called Passport to Heaven. It's available wherever books are sold. I highly recommend it. All of us need to read this and read what the scripture says about what it means to live for and walk with Christ on a daily basis. Thank you. Great to have you with us today. Thank you, Terry. Roxanna lost her job in the pandemic, and soon the bills began to pile up. Suddenly, she had no money for food. Roxanna had nowhere to run for help. So how was she able to feed her family? Watch this. Roxana is a single mom. She worked in the hotel industry until the coronavirus hit. When she lost her job, she suddenly struggled to make ends meet. The pandemic started and I had no job. I didn't have any money to pay my bills and I couldn't afford any food. And it feels like you just have nowhere else to run. Then she found out about Operation Blessing Partners Services of Hope. The ministry receives food from Operation Blessing every month, helping provide for families like Roxana's. Well, my kids were uh, happy because we finally had something on the table. They're always excited to open those bags and see what, what's in there. They like the snacks, they like the cereal, they like the canned goods. It's good quality of food. Financially, it's been great because I get to pay my utilities, my water bill and my electric, and that helps me with my budget. It's just a big blessing. Now Roxana has a job in the real estate industry. She says she's grateful to those who gave to Operation Blessing. I would like to say thank you for supporting Operation Blessing. You know, when you put food on the table, it, it matters and it counts. I am very thankful. It's the best blessing that we can have. Isn't it awful in this country, as rich as we are, how many people are hungry? 
people don't have food, we want to help them. We have been helping them. Operation Blessing is helping them. Our hunger strike force. We try to, my goal was to have 100 million meals a year. I don't know if we're meeting that right now, but that's where we were heading. 100 million meals for people all over the America, but that's just a small token of what we do around the world. And how can you help? Well, it's real simple. You join the 700 Club, and part of what you do is goes into Operation Blessing. We can also take the gospel all around the world. But for those who join, it's $20 a month, 65 cents a day. And I want to give you something. This is called God is for us. It's verses of salvation and peace and victory from the book of Romans. And uh, we'll send this to you as our gift to you. And it's my joy that we can help you in some way. And pick up the phone, call in, and say, you know, I want to get these verses. You can play them. They'll bless you as you drive in your car, whatever you're doing. Um, just call in right now so you can count on me. Let's help the poor and the needy, but let's help those who are hurting. The Lord will bless us as we do, okay? Okay, time for some questions. Let's go for it. This is Eric who says, Hi, Pat. I've been married for a decade and struggled during the whole time in this marriage. I recently found out from a random guy at the airport that my wife has a Jezebel spirit. What do I do? I'm dying slowly because of the nasty stuff she's been doing and saying all these years. What else can I do other than pray? Uh, First thing I want to tell you, I don't believe I would take my theological counseling from a random friend at the airport. Amen. I just don't think that should be the source of our... No. But what is a Jezebel spirit? A Jezebel spirit was one who uh, counseled uh, adultery and fornication, but there's a witchcraft involved, a hatred, and um, if somebody has a... Uh, a, a spirit of hate. If you if you've been li li living a life with somebody who has got that kind of a spirit, then you either need to get that dear person delivered, or else make some arrangements because that is a very terrible thing. If indeed your wife is, uh, well, I mean Jezebel in the old say the in the Bible was committing fornication, and Jezebel was. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, wife of a wicked king, and she is one that wanted to kill people and so forth. I mean, it's murder and adultery. And I don't know if your wife has got that kind of thing. So I, I don't know how to counsel you on that one, okay? This is Leslie who says, you keep saying we need to vote, but I feel our vote was stolen this last election. You tell us we need to make our voices heard. How do we do this if our voices are being shut down? What can we do? Well, I, I think what we can do is to, first of all, make sure that the elections are honest. I, I, I know that this uh, uh, Dominion voting systems and also Smartmatic, they're suing people all around for slander. But we do feel that there were places where the elections weren't being counted properly. And I think we can support laws that are being put in place in Georgia and Florida and other places, and more recently in Arizona, to make sure that the elections are, there is integrity. And, you know, uh, you could be a poll washer. If somebody's in the thing watching, it makes a difference. One of the problems in the last election was that it was after the poll watchers left that some of these cases of fraud took place. So eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, all right? This is Val who says, Dear Pat, recently my soon-to-be daughter-in-law and her family took actions that involved my family and friends that were against my requests. They were done behind my back. My son will not admit that this was unchristian-like. He only tells me not to hold a grudge. I am trying to forgive. However, I think I'm the only one who sees that this was wrong, which bothers me. Also, I still have a lot of hurt feelings. So am I at a stage that I'm not forgiving their actions? You know, I, I wish you'd been a little more specific in that it's too general to make a, mm. a, a, a overall statement on. Uh, the idea you don't hold a grudge is true. Forgiving is Christian. But at the same time, if there was a pattern of deceit, and if your son is being misled uh, into some uh, activity that is not appropriate, then you have every reason to get involved and find out about it. So 
I, I don't know if I'm answering your question because it's too vague. <laughs> it's too vague to answer. Well, she doesn't say what the issue was. Exactly. Just that she's the only one who thinks it was wrong. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about, all right? This is Wayne who says, "Do God's commandments apply to the entire known universe?" <laughs> well, I, I I think they apply to the people involved. I think if you're a member of, of a church body, those commandments apply to you. If you're a Jew. The certain commandments apply to you, but I think they're fundamental. The covenant of God with mankind was irrevocable. When human beings were created, uh, they were created in God's image, and He gave them certain commandments, and they're embedded in the hearts of mankind. And so I don't care where you are, you'll have a guilty conscience. They know that murder is wrong. They know that certain other things are wrong. And uh, I think it's universal, all right? This is Roberta who says, My grandson was murdered in December, and I can't seem to enjoy any part of my life. Every day I struggle with wanting to live or die. I've been walking with God since I was a toddler, but I feel broken. What should I do? The Bible talks about having our conscience cleansed from dead works to serve the living God. And God wants to give you a fresh start. That's the whole thing of salvation and redemption. Uh, and he turns the page and starts all over. You, you've got to let that stuff go. You cannot hold on to it, whether it's grief, whether it's hatred, whether it's animosity, whatever it is, that will corrode you. And you, you, you can't bring your son back to life. So by your feeling grieving, you're not helping a soul. So I think all I can say is get your mind into the Bible, cleanse your thoughts through the Word of God, and praise God for His goodness today, okay? Well, today's Power Minute is from the book of Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, tomorrow we've got a YouTube star with three million followers. You'll find that interesting, Rob Kenny. That's right. I don't, Forward I'm to not one of his YouTube followers, but, but you'll Rob get to know him on the 700. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye-bye.